And it is two o'clock. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm still using the same microphone as last time, but I'm going to try not to obstruct it this time. So please let me know if there's any problem with the sound. Not that there's probably much I can do about it um, at this particular moment, but do let me know if there is a problem and at least I can go, oh, or something like that. Anyway, this is a bit rem reminiscent to me of my old days uh, working the graveyard shift at various radio stations. Um, everybody else has pretty much gone to bed around here, and uh, it's the middle of the night, so I'm up and I'm talking, and God knows if anybody's listening, but like I said, that's kind of reminiscent and familiar of the good old days of radio. So, uh, but as I said, just... Uh, Drop me a, a comment if it's uh, if it's not sounding proper, and I will again probably not do anything about it. But I will commiserate. I will shake my head in an unhappy way. So what else is there to talk about? Um, just uh, hello, everybody. God, it's good to see you, and even well, virtually. You know what I mean. It's it's good to be here. It's good to make contact. It's good to be in the world, um, all hanging out together. And it's good to have uh, uh, relatively safe readers, friends, and family. Um, so I hope you are all continuing to hang in there in what is a very difficult time for many people. Um, I, I can't complain. I'm living my kind of normal life. Nobody phones me. I don't phone anybody. Well on a few people, but um, I hang out, I work all day, I write, um, I participate in the dinner ritual such as it is, whoever's cooking or buying or picking up. So, uh, like I said, nothing really to complain about. Uh, I spent the entire day today doing fidgety stuff, but it was all writing related. Um, for those of you who care about these things, I'll tell you because you might actually be interested. What I was working on all day today is um, I'm in rewrites with the short novel that's going to go um, come out before the uh, the last book of the the, uh, the new trilogy. So before the Navigator's Children, there is going to be this short book, still tentatively called The Shadow of Things to Come. And because I was working on it at at one point during the process of preparing this book. I had this horrifying realization. There's all these, this is the problem with being an obsessive compulsive author, is that there are no simple solutions to things. You can't just go like, ah, well, nobody will notice, because I notice, and I freak out about these things. So I realized partway through this project, which is the telling of, um, again, for those of you familiar with the Ostinard stuff, all that material, you won't need to have this explained, but, um, for people to, uh, who don't know it, that well, won't probably help much. But anyway, this is, it's a story about the, um, the time that Inaluki, who later becomes the Storm King, and his brother Hakatri, who plays a major part in the uh, Navigator's Children, um, when they are uh, young and they go off to fight a dragon. And um, various important historical things happen from there, but that's not what kept me nutsy, nutsy today. Um, somewhere during the process, early on actually, I realized that this all takes place before all the humans have named all these places yet, the, the mortals as it were, who, who, from whose point of view we have always previously seen these things. And thus we've heard all the names of all these many places in the mortal languages. But because this story is told more from the point of view of the Sithi, the elven Folk, but in this case also um, the servant of one of the Sithi, who is not um, a Sithi himself, but is a Tanuka Daya. Again, there's a word for tad readers that they'll know. Um, I realized that I couldn't use any of the normal names for these places, or very few of them, and that everything had to be renamed with its original Sithi names. So I'm literally having, and they cover a huge amount of territory here. So I've been having to come up with Sithi names for all these parts of Ostenard. 
So it's been entertaining and interesting as far as learning more about my created world and more about its history, but it's exactly the kind of fidgety, tiny stuff, you know, where you're saying, I don't know, that doesn't really look like a this and such, you know, it seems like they wouldn't use that kind of work, you know, so I'm just all day long just to name 10 or 12 landmarks. I'm fidgeting, I'm looking things up, I'm, you know, doing complicated things to do with all the bits of Sithi language that have crept into the books over the years to make sure that everything makes sense. Anyway, so that's how I spent my day today. Um, but that's not a complaint. Again, I'm very happy to do it. So, um, but anyway, so yeah, so I, I, I had to take one of these lovely maps that Isaac Stewart made and I had to cover it with little purple smears and drawings as I was writing in the names of where various things are. Here, you can look at it even. You can see what they're all called. See, they're up there at the top. The Sithi name for the Nornfells is the Crown of Bones. So that's what I've been doing with my day today. Okay, yeah, and Ilva writes, Ron will be in heaven with the new names. Well, I hope so. Ron may point out to me how stupidly I've renamed something that already had a name, because that's the problem with other people knowing my work better than I know it. Uh, well, not all of my work, but you know what I mean. The, there are several people out there, Ilva is one of them, Ron is another, who've been reading these things over and over again while I was writing other books. So they're more well-versed than I am. Anyway, anyway, um, I, I am actually going to read some stuff tonight. I had a little poll, I guess, um, on the uh, Facebook page and saying, you know, I'm running out of short, cheerful stories to read. So should I start reading longer stories and maybe split them up, read novels, read other people's stories? And apparently the uh, consensus, or well, not the consensus, but at least the majority for the moment are saying, yeah, read the longer stories and divide them up. So that's one of the things that that's what's going to happen tonight. I'm going to read you uh, half of one of my, my personal favorite stories. And then we will get the other half next week at the same bat time, same bat channel, except maybe it should be same tad time, same tad channel. But anyway, so next week I will finish this story, um, but tonight I am going to read halfway through it. And this is a story called <clears throat> The Happiest Dead Boy in the World. And it is an Otherland story. It takes place after the Otherland novels. It is uh, of interest for a variety of reasons to people who like my work because one of the things I intend to do in the near future is actually write another, at least one more Otherland novel. Who knows? Maybe more. But I have tentative plans for uh, a book called The Book of Orlando. And much of that will have to do with Orlando Gardner, who uh, had an interesting path through the Otherland books. And um, I don't think it's going to give away anything that won't be given away in the story to say that the Orlando, the physical Orlando does not survive the other land books, but Orlando as a personality does survive the other land books. There now I've given something away. Um, and so I am going to read the first half of this story tonight. It was originally published in the Legends 2 anthology edited by Robert Silverberg. I don't have a copy of that. I'm not even sure where in the household that I have it. But I'm reading a copy out of one of my own anthologies. Uh, it is a very, very um, complicated story. So maybe it'll help to have two halves and people can ask each other, <laughs> what the hell did that mean? Um, and before I get to the second half, so I'll give you a chance. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do tonight. I don't know how long it'll last, but it probably won't take me a full hour because, as I said, it's only half of a story. So, reading The Happiest Dead Boy in the World. Oh, and because this was written for an anthology, I'm not going to explain too much because I think I put a lot of information, as I did with the other Otherland story that I read you, The Boy Detective in Oz, story. Um, there's a lot of kind of catch people up detail, as I recall, in the story itself. 
So now we're shipping back and forth between various classes. So here is the happiest dead boy in the world, part one. Theragorn, the ranger, was deep in conversation with Elrond Half-Elven in the quiet shadows of Rivendell's Hall of Fire. The man of the West had just returned from roaming through the world, and he and the Elven Lord had not spoken together in a long time. Things of moment were in their minds, not least of which a sudden rash of goblin raids near the Misty Mountains. Thus it was that the Elven Messenger, with the graceful diffidence of his kind, waited for some long moments in the doorway before either of them noticed him. A visitor is here who wishes to speak to Theragorn, the elf replied to Elrond's question. He seems to be a halfling. Yeah, that would be me. The voice was louder and it had to be said a little best bit less cultured than what was normally to be heard in the house of the great elven lord. The figure in the doorway was half the size of anyone else present, his feet covered in hair so thick and matted he appeared to be standing ankle deep in the corpses of two small mountain goats. Bongo Fluffinutta, at your service, he said with a sweeping bow. Hey, nice place you got here, Elrond. Love the old world craftsmanship. Uh, Theragorn, can you spare a second? Oh, for God's sakes, Beazel, the ranger said under his breath. I, I am truly sorry, he told the master of the house. Will you excuse me for a moment? Of course. Elrond looked a little puzzled, although the simulation was adept at incorporating or simply ignoring anomalies. Is it really a halfling? We have not seen such a one, I think, since Gandalf brought his friend Bilbo Baggins to us from the Shire some years ago. Uh, yes, well, this is a different sort of hobbit, Theragorn lowered his voice. A less successful branch of the species, if you get my drift. Hey, I heard that. Elrond and the messenger withdrew, leaving Theragorn, also known as Orlando Gardner, alone in the high-raftered hall with his small, shabby visitor. Beazel, what the hell are you doing? Don't blame me, boss. You're the one who said I couldn't show up here unless I was in character. He lifted a foot and admired it. What do you think? Nice pelt, huh? Bongo Fluffernutter? Isn't that the kind of name they all have? Geez, I've only got so much room for Tolkien trivia, you know. Orlando stared at the pint-sized horror in front of him. Whether it was a better fit with the simulation than Beezlebug's normal, multi-legged, cartoonish appearance was open to debate. But there was no doubt he was looking at the world's ugliest hobbit. Orlando was beginning to suspect the software agent's sense of humor had moved on a bit beyond what was covered by the original warranty. Maybe he'd given Beezle a little too much freedom over the years for self-programming off the net. I mean, really, Beazle said. Look at which pot's calling which kettle black, boss. Theragorn? Theragorn? Are you just waiting around here for the return of the sking or something? Ha ha. Oh, you're one funny piece of code. I picked it because it sounds like Thargor, who had been, of course, Orlando's online avatar for most of his childhood the brawny barbarian swordsman who had conquered so many game worlds back in the old days, when Orlando Gardner had still had a real world to return to at the end of the adventure. Not that he wasn't a little embarrassed by it now, by it all now. Look, I wanted something easy to remember. Do you remember, do you know how many names I have on this network? He realized he was justifying himself. He realized that he was justifying himself to an entity that had once been a birthday present and not even the most expensive present he had received that year. Uh, what was it you wanted, anyway? Just to do my job, boss. Beazle actually sounded hurt. I'm only serving as a furry-footed link to your busy social calendar. We already talked about dinner with your folks, so I know you remember that. Uh, you know you got Frederick scheduled in first, right? Yeah, she's meeting me here. 
Oh, oh good. I, I'm sure that'll be fun for everyone. May I recommend the Hall of Endless Nostalgic Singing? Or, or perhaps the, the Silvery Giggling Lounge? Your sarcasm is noted. It wasn't as though Orlando didn't harbor occasional less than reverent thoughts about the Tolkien world himself, but it was still the closest thing he had to a home, after all. Back in the beginning of his full-time life on the network, when Orlando had been overwhelmed by all that had happened to him, Middle Earth, and Rivendell in particular, had been a blessed haven for him, a familiar, much-loved place where he could relax and heal and come to terms with his responsibilities, and even with the possibilities of immortality, a subject that surrounded him on every side in Elrond's ancient residence. Uh, by the way, tonight's also the first Friday of the month in Woodhouse World, Beasel went on. Did you remember that too? Oh, Fen Fen. No, I forgot. How long do I have? Their yeah, meeting's in about three hours. Thanks. I'll be there. But Beasel just stood, waiting expectantly, forcing Orlando to ask, uh, what is it now? Well, if I have to stay in character and walk out of this overgrown bed and breakfast and all the way across the bridge just so I can leave the simulation, you could at least say, fare thee well, bongo fluffinutter, or something. Orlando glowered. You're joking. It's only polite. Fen fen. But Beazle showed no signs of leaving without it. Cheers, then. Fare thee well, bongo fluffernutter. Yeah, don't forget, and may your toes grow ever more curly. Just get out of here. Oh, okay. Uh, fare thee well also, Theragorn, cuddler of elves. It turned out Beazle could move pretty quickly on those furry feet when he had to. Sam Fredericks was almost an hour late, but that was all right. Guests could get something to eat and drink at pretty much all hours in Rivendell if they didn't mind the limited menu. The people who had programmed the SimWorld years ago, a team from the Netherlands, as Orlando had discovered, had stuck to the original books very carefully. There was no specific mention in the books of meat being served in Imladris, the elven name for Elrond's sumptuous house. So what the kitchen offered was pretty much limited to bread, honey, fruit, vegetables, and dairy products. Orlando, who had spent a lot of time in the Tolkien simulation during his early years, early days living in the network, could remember more than a few times when he would have been willing to crawl to Mordor for some pepperoni. When Sam showed up, she looked exactly the same as she had on her last visit, dressed in the manner of a male elf, her coffee and cream skin radiant, her frizzy hair a glorious confusion held only by a cloth band that made her look slightly piratical. She and Orlando hugged. Sam let go first. Something to eat? I'm not really hungry, she said. You go ahead if you want to. Sam, the food here won't fill you up, and I don't need to eat at all. It's just social. He led her onto one of the covered balconies instead. They could hear the river ringing in the valley below them, although the lanterns of Rivendell only illuminated the tops of the trees. Sam slid onto a bench. Orlando sat down beside her and stretched his long legs. That was one of the holdovers from his illness that even he recognized. He was never going to be in a sick or crippled body again if he could avoid it. So, you? he asked. Are you okay? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, you know, getting around, keeping an eye on things. This whole job has turned out a lot different than I expected. When I first agreed to be the sort of head park ranger for the network, I thought I'd be, I don't know, stopping wars or something. Sam smiled. Like Superman? Or God, yeah. I try not to limit my ambitions. He waited. Sam's laugh was a little late. But since uh, Mr. Sellers and Kunahara convinced all the others to let the whole Simiverse go free range, I'm, I'm kind of more like an anthropologist or something. Patrick Sellers had brought together the group of people who had prevented the network from being used for its original purpose, which had been to give immortality within its confines to the Grail Brotherhood, a group of people as unpleasant as they were rich. 
Kunahara, a former minor member of the Grail who had changed sides, joined Sellers at the end in saving the network, and, in essence, saving the lives of all the network's complex sims, as well as Orlando himself, who had been copied into the network before his physical death and now existed only as information. Sellers, too, had soon after left his own dying body behind to take up existence on the Otherland network, but unlike Orlando, his move had been voluntary. Anthropologist? Sam prompted. Yeah, well, except for fixing obvious code errors, which don't happen much, I, I mostly make a lot of reports and, and keep an eye on the interesting, unexpected stuff. But since Sellers is gone now and Kunahara is so majorly busy, I kind of wonder who I'm making reports for. The rest of us, I guess, and other people who might study it someday. Sam shrugged. Do you miss him, Sellers? Yeah, I can't say we were utterly friends or anything. Not like you and me. He hoped to see her smile, but she only nodded. He was just too... something. Old. Smart. But I liked him a lot once I got to know him, and he was the only person who lived here with me, Sam. I knew he wasn't going to be around forever, that he was tired, that he wanted to follow his information people out into the great whatever. But I sort of thought we'd get to have him for a few more years. He was playing it down, of course, for Sam's benefit. It had been even more devastating than he had expected when Sellers moved on. Orlando had felt deserted bereft. After all, the crippled ex-pilot had been the only other person in the universe truly to understand the strangeness of knowing you were alive only on a network, that your real body was ashes now, that most of the people who had known you thought you were dead and were more or less right. Also, Sellers had been a kind person and, either because or in despite of his own suffering, a good listener. He had been one of the only people who ever saw Orlando Gardner cry. That had been back in the earliest days of living on the network, of course. Orlando didn't cry anymore. He didn't have the time for things like that. Sam and Orlando sat on the Rivendell balcony another half an hour, talking about all manner of things, even sharing a few jokes, but Orlando continued to feel something awkward in his friend's behavior. It touched him with something he had never expected to feel around Sam Fredericks. It took him long minutes to recognize it as fear. He was almost terrified by the idea that she might not want to be here with him, that their friendship had finally become no more than an obligation. They had wandered back to the subject of the network. To his surprise, she seemed to think he was the one who needed cheering up. It's still an amazing job you have. The ranger for a whole universe, all those worlds, your responsibility. 398 at the moment, but a few others have just temporarily collapsed, and they'll cycle back on again. That's like a quarter of what there used to be, but sellers just switched a bunch of them off because they were too scanny, too violent, or creepy, or criminal. I know, Orlando. I, I was at that meeting, too. Are you sure you're okay, Sam? You seem, I don't know, sad. He looked her up and down. And now that I think about it, you haven't changed Sims in like a year's worth of visits. So? Geez, Gardner, you're the one who wants everyone to dress up all elfy wealthy here. I don't mean the clothes. He almost told her about Beazle's version of Rivendell Chic, but he could not get past what was suddenly bothering him. Sam, what's, what's going on? Is there a reason you won't change your sim? You must have something more up-to-date you use for remotes and friend lines and all back home. She shrugged. She was doing that a lot, but would not meet his eyes. Yeah? But what does it matter? I, I thought you were my friend, Orlando. Is it really that important to see if, if my boobs have grown since the last time you saw me? He flinched. You think that's why I want to see the real you? No. I don't know. What's your problem? He swallowed down the anger, mostly because it scared him to be angry at her. 
There were times when it felt like his friendship with Salome Fredericks was the only thing that kept him connected to the world he had been forced to leave behind. His parents were different. They were his parents, for God's sakes, and always would be. And the other survivors of the Otherland Network would always be his friends as well. But Sam, damn it, Fredericks, don't you get it? You're, you're part of me. Thanks a lot. Despite the mocking words, she looked more unhappy than angry. All my life, I wanted to be something important. But part of the great Orlando Gardner? <gasps> I never even hoped. That's not what I mean, and you know it. Fen-Fen, I mean, you're in my, okay, you're in my heart, even though that sounds utterly drooly. You're why I still feel like I'm a living person when, well, we both know I'm not. Now she was the one to flinch, but some kind of wall still loomed between them. What does that have to do with my sim? When you first met me, you thought I was a boy. But this is, this is different, Sam. He hesitated, then put his hand on her arm. The world's most powerful simulation engine made it feel just as it was supposed to feel. The warm skin on her wrist, the velvety folds of her sleeve over muscle and tendon and bone. I know I'm never going to grow up, not in the normal way. I, I may not have a real body anymore, but that doesn't mean I expect everyone else to play with me forever here in the Peter Pan playground. Look at me, Sam. He knew it was mostly guilt that kept her eyes on him, but just now he was willing to use whatever he had. If you hide things from me, especially the normal stuff, because you think I can't take it, well, that's the worst thing I can think of. I was a cripple my whole life. Having progeria wasn't just knowing I was going to die young, it was having every single person who saw me for the first time look at me and then, and then look away real fast. Like I was some kind of horrible human car accident. Even the decent ones who tried to treat me like anyone else. Well, it, let's just say it was obvious they were working at it. I don't want to be pitied ever again, Sam. She looked miserable and ashamed. I still don't understand, Orlando. What does that have to do with my sim? You don't want me to see the way you look now, but it's not because you've got a zit or something and you're embarrassed. It's because you know you look different, that you're growing or changing or whatever. Tell me I'm wrong. Geez, Fredericks, I've been living on this network almost three years. Do you think I expect things not to change? It's not going to hurt me, but if you can't show me, then, well, it's like you don't trust our friendship, like we can only be the kind of kid buddies we used to be back in the middle country game. She looked at him with something of the familiar Sam in her expression again, amused even though she was irritated. Same old gardener, you still know everything. She took a long breath. Okay. You want to see how I look now? Fine. For a moment, her Rivendell self froze as she reselected her appearance, the new information passing through the series of blind, blind relays that kept the very private Otherland network isolated from the real world net. Then suddenly, like a hard copy picture dropped onto the top of a stack, Sam's image changed. Satisfied? You don't look that different, he said, but it wasn't really true. She was an inch or two taller, but also more curved and womanly. She had wider hips that the elven breeches only emphasized. The Sam he had known had been a, a greyhound slender athlete. She also had a length to her face that he hadn't seen before. She was really lovely, and not just because she was the Sam he loved. He also realized he hadn't told the truth about something else. Seeing her suddenly a year older, 17 instead of 16, did hurt. It hurt like hell. Thanks. Oh, Orlando, I'm sorry. I'm being utterly jacked. It's, it's not that. It's not any of that. She slumped on the bench, leaned forward until she could rest her elbows on her knees. She had stopped meeting his eye again. It's just, I'm seeing somebody. For a moment, he didn't understand what she meant, thought she was still talking about sims and images. 
Oh, is it serious? I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess. We've been going around together for a couple of months. Orlando took a breath. Well, I, I hope it works out. Fen Fen, Frederico, is that what's been bothering you all day? We've been past that jealousy stuff for a long time. In part, he had to admit, because Sam had made it clear from the beginning of their real friendship, after he knew she was a girl and she knew about his illness, that although she loved him as much as he loved her, it was never going to be the romantic kind. Which was just as well, he had decided, because what they had was going to last their whole life and not be messed up by sex. He often wondered if real living teenagers told themselves the same kind of pathetic lies he did. I don't know, it just scares me. Sometimes I feel like, she shook her head, like I'm not a very good friend for you, to you, she amended hurriedly. I don't see you as often as I should. You must think I'm terrible. He laughed, surprised. It, it, it never even occurred to me. You know, Sam, no offense, but it's not like when you're not here, I just sit around waiting for your next visit. Two days ago, I was dodging arrows at Edo while a bunch of warlords tried to overthrow the Tokugawa shogunate. The week before, I spent a few days with Captain Nemo exploring some undersea ruins. So, so you're okay with everything? Not bored or lonely? He gave her arm another squeeze before letting go. The elves were singing again in the Hall of Fire, a meditation on the light of the two trees. The voices seemed almost to belong to the valley itself, to the night and the forest and the river singing together. Bored? Not when I consider the alternatives. No, don't fret about me, Frederico. I always have places to go, things to do, people to see. Why, I must be the happiest dead boy in the whole wide world. It wasn't really so much that Sam was dating someone that was bothering him he thought, as he got ready to connect to his parents' house, or even that she'd kept it a secret for a while. In fact, now that he thought of it, he still didn't know if her new soulmate was male or female. Sam had always been funny that way, not wanting to talk about those sorts of things, irritated by questions, as if Orlando might think differently about her if she ever clarified her gender and sexual issues. No, it wasn't so much that she was dating someone, or even that she was growing up. He loved her, he, he really, truly did, and he wanted her to have a happy life no matter what. Instead, it was the sudden worry that he might not be growing up himself. As he had always assumed he was, however weird his situation, he felt a chill and wondered whether he was becoming irrelevant to everything, not just to Sam. Whether despite the fact that years were passing for him in make-believe land, just as they did for her in the real world, his experiences here might not be the same as growing up at all. Maybe you have to be real to do it, he thought. Maybe you have to do real things. Make a fool of yourself at a party, trip and skin your knee, fall in love, or, or just, just have a heartbeat. Maybe I'll never really change. I'll be like one of the Sims, a Sim of a 14-year-old kid, forever. He pushed away the sickening thought. He had enough to deal with right now. Tonight was family night, which was hard enough to get through at the best of times. It didn't really seem fair, being dead and still having to go home for visits. Not that he didn't love Conrad and Vivian. In fact, it was because he loved them so much that it could be so difficult. He took a deep breath in a metaphorical sort of way. He felt as if he was taking a deep breath anyway. And as he did so, he remembered that his mother and father apparently had a surprise for him tonight. They had asked him to connect to a different location in the house for his visit instead of the wall screen. Well, actually, it's Conrad's surprise, his mother had explained. She had smiled, but she hadn't seemed entirely pleased with whatever it was going to be. Orlando had seen that expression before. She had worn it when Conrad had given him the bike for his 11th birthday. Anyone, even Orlando himself, could have told his father that his bones were too brittle and his muscles too weak even to think of riding a bicycle. 
but Conrad Gardner had insisted that his chance should have every, his son should have every chance to be normal. When Orlando had become more or less bedridden in the last year, they had finally gotten rid of the bicycle to make more room in the garage for medical equipment, spare filters, and oxygen pods. Sorry, I lost my place for a moment. When Orlando had become more or less bedridden in the last year, they had finally got rid of it to make more room in the garage for medical equipment, spare filters, and oxygen pods. He never had ridden it, of course. As he made the connection, Orlando wondered why he couldn't just join them through the wall screen as usual. He liked doing that because it felt no different than an ordinary kid to parents call, as though he were simply away at school in a different state instead of living in what was functionally a different universe. Maybe Conrad swapped in the old screen for one of those deep field things, he thought. He was talking a while, a while back about investing in one of the solid crystal ones. The connection opened, and he was looking at his parents, who looked back at him. His mother was teary-eyed, as she always was when they first saw each other. His father was beaming with what looked like pride, but there was also something unusual about the way they both appeared. It took him a moment to process what it was. I'm looking through a different imager, he decided. I guessed right. It's a new screen. But if his parents had indeed bought a new unit, he suddenly realized they had installed it in the dining room instead of the living room. He could see the old oak sideboard behind their heads with a poster of the French can-can dancers next to it that had hung on the wall there for years. Hi, what's up, new screen? Without thinking, he raised his hand to blow a mom to blow his mom a kiss, as he always did. Yes, it was embarrassing, but you had to do things differently when you couldn't actually touch. And something shadowy rushed toward him. Even after years without a real body, he could not help flinching a little. The new thing stopped and hung in his view in the same way a simulated hand would. It was a hand, but not being simulated on his end. Instead, it seemed to be looming in front of his parents' screen and thus, effect thus effectively hanging in front of his eyes, a weird-looking, smooth, maroon hand made of what appeared to be shiny plasteel. Half forgetting his bodiless state, he reached out to touch it. The hand reached out too, extending away from his viewpoint, just as if it were his own hand responding to his thoughts. Fascinated and troubled, as he began to catch on, he tried to make the fingers wiggle, as he would with one of his own simulated hands. The fingers wiggled. But these fingers weren't on one of his sims, and they weren't even in the network. They were in Conrad and Vivian's dining room in the real world. What the hell is this? Do you like it? His father was nodding, the way he used to nod when someone was trying out his home-brewed beers, back when they had still had visitors. Well, that's one thing, Orlando thought. Now that I'm gone, at least they can have people over again. Like it? What is it? Some kind of robot arm attached to the new screen? It's not a new screen. It's a whole body. So you can, you know, be here, inside the house with us, whenever you want. Orlando had discovered the other arm. He flexed it, held the two hands up together, then looked down. The viewpoint swiveled, showed him the cylindrical, beet-colored torso, the jointed legs. A body? I should have thought of it before, his father said. I don't know why I didn't. Your software agent used to have that little body with all the mechanical legs so it could crawl around the house, remember? I looked around until I found something that seemed like it would work. It's a remote figure they use for certain kinds of reconnaissance operations. I think it was built for Antarctica originally, maybe military or something. I found a collector and bought it. I had to get different feet put on it. It sort of had hands at the end of its legs. He was clearly a little bit nervous when he was nervous, Conrad babbled. Better for climbing and moving on ice or something. I'm surprised they weren't skis or tractor treads or maybe... Conrad, Vivian said, that's enough. I don't want to hear about hands on legs. It's disturbing. She darted a quick look at Orlando, who was more than a little stunned. What? What am I looking out of? The face, his father said. 
Well, it should be, but we'll have to change what you're putting out from your end. I, I didn't want to spoil the surprise. So right now there's a, a whole little Orlando standing there in the face screen. I, I'm still trying to figure this out. You mean I'm supposed to move around in this? Sure, go ahead. Conrad was delighted by the question. Walk, you can go anywhere in the house. He doesn't have to if he doesn't want to, said his mother. Orlando flexed his muscles, or performed the mental actions that flexed muscles in the real world and the better virtual worlds. The cartoon fingers reached out and gripped the tabletop. He put his feet under him and stood. The point of view rose, not altogether steadily. Now that he was listening for it, he could hear the faint, wet hiss of fibromotors bunching and relaxing. Do you need some help? No, Conrad, I'll be okay. He got up and took a few swaying steps, then stopped to look down at the feet. They were huge ovals, like Mickey Mouse shoes. It was strange to be in a body as clumsy as this. His other land network bodies all responded exactly as though they were his own, and made him stronger, faster, and far more nimble than he had ever been in real life. He hadn't been in the bathroom since his death. It was interesting, even strangely touching to have movement around his old house restored to him, but he wasn't sure about any of this. He looked at his reflection in the mirror, the strange stick figure shape of the thing. The screen in the faceplate showed Orlando's full body sim so that he looked like one of those giant Japanese robot monsters with a human controller rattling around inside its head. He rescaled his sim's output so that only the face appeared, and suddenly, even though it wasn't his real face, not by a long shot. No one, including Orlando himself, had seen that since his physical body had been cremated. It made the whole thing more real and also far more disturbing. Is this what they want for me? This thing? He knew that Conrad meant well, but his parents were only trying to find a way to make his continued presence in their lives more real, more physical, but he didn't know if he could stand to live for even short periods as this stalking, plasticized scarecrow. He looked at the face he used with his parents, a teenage face appropriate to his age, made with help from various police forensic illustration nodes, scaled up from scans of his own skull and incorporating features from both his mother and father. Not even a real face to begin with. The face of the kid they should have had, he thought stuck on this thing now, like a, like a lollipop on a stick. Orlando did his best. He sat through dinner and tried to concentrate as his parents told him things about friends and relatives, about their jobs and the small annoyances of life in security-walled Crown Heights community, but he felt even more like an alien than he usually did. The servo muscles on the body were clumsy, and the tactors less than less advanced than what he was used to. He knocked over his mother's mother his mother's glass twice and almost tipped the table over when he stood up at the end of the meal. I'm gonna have to make it an early night, he said. Are you all right? his mother asked. You seem sort of down. I'm fine. I, I just got a meeting to go to at the drones club. Oh, uh, that's that 1920s English place you told us about? Conrad asked. That must be interesting. Didn't you say there was a war there? Sort of. It was still hard to make his parents understand about John Dredd, about the terrible destruction the killer had wrought in so many of the Otherland network worlds in the brief days he had ruled over the system as a kind of evil god. The, uh, the simulation is coming back, but we're letting things sort themselves out instead of just wiping out what's happened and starting the cycles over. So there's there's some pretty scanny stuff going on in some of them. Adaptations, almost like after a forest fire has changed an ecosystem. Very barky. He noticed their puzzled faces. Barky, it means funny, uh, the weird kind of funny. You know so much about these things, his mother said. This complicated network. You've learned so much, and and you've really worked hard to make something out of Vivian Fennis was about to say something like, your terrible situation, but of course she was too much of an old hand for that. Too smart and too kind 
to mess up this proud mom moment she was giving him. Out of your life in this new world, new universe really, it's still so hard to believe or even understand. You have the makings of a first class scientific education there, Conrad chimed in, even if it's not the accredited type. Life experience has to count for something, doesn't it? Maybe someday. This all has to stay secret, Conrad. Me, the Otherland Network, everything. If it ever becomes public, there will be lawsuits for decades over who owns the network. It's worth gazillions. It'll be torn apart by the military looking for weapons quality code at the very least. You know that. Orlando tried to puncture his dad's fantasies gently, but they did have to be punctured. Conrad came up with hopeful, impractical plans every few months, and some of them made the maroon robot body seem positively normal. Look, the chances are that I'm not ever going to live here in the real world again. I'm sorry. I wish I could have had a grown-up life here and, and done all the things you guys wanted for me. He took a breath. He found himself getting angry and he didn't want to, but why did everyone keep projecting their ridiculous expectations and ideas onto him? He more or less figured on getting it from his parents, but Sam's lack of trust in him was still hurting. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is a lot better than being dead. Don't worry about me. Like you said, the network's a whole new universe and I'm the one who gets to explore it. I'm happy. Happy or not, he was beginning to feel like he couldn't breathe. He did his best to be cheerful as he said his goodbyes, even allowing his mother and father to give the robot body a hug, although it was a weird and uncomfortable experience, probably even for Conrad. As he sat the mechanical form down in a chair, so it wouldn't fall over when he was no longer animating it, Orlando was finding it harder and harder to hide his ugly mood. Getting out of the horrible, whirring prison and back into the freedom of the network was like finally being allowed to take off a scratchly, ill-fitting Christmas sweater, sweater after the aunt who gave it to him had finally gone home. He had half an hour to kill before the meeting of the World Walkers Society. He had wandered the streets of P.G. Woodhouse's London, thinking, Before dread, this simulation world had been a shiny little confection of unadulterated good cheer. A London where the, where the poor were content to be that way and the unguilty rich could concentrate on important things like eating a really good breakfast and avoiding dragonish ants who could pop up and spoil the aforementioned breakfast, not to mention zillions of other innocent pastimes with amazing swiftness. Now this particular London had become a much different place. Like some socialist demagogue that even the most paranoid Tory could barely have imagined, John Dredd had first enraged and then armed the city's working class, a group in short supply in Woodhouse, but not entirely absent. A horde, consisting mostly of gardeners, butlers, chauffeurs, delivery men, maids, and cab drivers, had stormed the haunts of the upper crust, besieging and attacking the rich in their mansions, Kensington flats and clubs. Whole blocks had been put to the torch as some of Woodhouse's wild-eyed socialists and anarchists, rumored but scarcely ever seen in the original books, turned out to be more than merely rumor, and a few turned out to be dab hands at arson as well. There had even been some massacres, public slaughters of the class enemies, the class of the victims depending on which side was top of form at that particular moment of the struggle. Although, because of the happy-go-lucky nature of the Woodhouse world, even Dredd's malign influence had waned quickly once his direct supervision had ended. Still, by the time Sellers and Kunahara had gotten round to shutting down the particulars of Dredd's intervention, some weeks after Dredd himself had been dethroned, the city had descended into a sort of weird twilight state, something that combined the ruination of post-Blitz London with the freewheeling lawlessness of its earlier Elizabethan incarnation and more than a touch of the fearful shadows that had clung to the 19th century city during the Jack the Ripper crimes. Curzon Street was full of horses and wagons these days. Very few cars had survived the unpleasantness as the reign of terror was referred to. And Orlando had to watch what was under his feet as he made his way to Hyde Park. The squatter camps that had appeared in the first few weeks of the upheaval had become more or less permanent settlements, 
and with the chill evening coming down, bonfires burned everywhere. It didn't do to walk too obliviously through the park. Desperately cold and hungry people had long ago obliterated the park squirrels and the waterfowl of the serpentine and chopped down most of the beautiful old trees for fuel. Many wealthy folk who supposed that now the unpleasantness had ended, they could return to riding along Rotten Row, had discovered that although horse meat might come into the park on its own hooves, as in the old days, the only way it was leaving again was inside someone's stomach. However, if anyone could walk heedless of personal safety in Hyde Park these days, it was Orlando Gardner, the system's bashful demigod. And the demigod had a lot to consider. Is it just me? Conrad and Vivian mean well. Why is it so hard to humor them? After all, I'm their only kid, and it's pretty obvious things aren't going to work out the way they hoped. No graduation, no girlfriends, no marriage, no grandkids. But no matter how he thought about it, he couldn't feel anything but resentful horror at the idea of wearing that remote body. Instead of making him feel more natural, it did the opposite. It made the distance between his new life and his old one more acute, as though the real world had become some kind of alien planet, a toxic environment he could only enter dressed in a clanking robot suit. The fact that the real world had become exactly that for him, and had been that way for going on three years, didn't matter. As long as he only visited his folks by phone, he could half pretend he was just putting in a year in Africa with the UN Service Corps or something. But now Conrad's compulsion to fix things was going to put a serious crimp in Orlando's hard-earned denial. It was the stuff with Sam, though, that really got to him. He didn't want to be someone that never grew up, never changed, no matter what he experienced. That was worse than the suit. That was like being truly dead. He would be a sort of ghost. A ghost in a dead universe, he thought. Nothing changing. Not me. Not these worlds. He turned back across the park toward Dover Street in the club. Crews of young toughs were gathered around rubbish, tin bonfire, rubbish bin bonfires, singing mocking serenades to their rivals. It sounded like they might be working up to a reading, as in a read and write, local slang for a gang fight. They're free range, he reminded himself. None of my business. Happens all the time anyway, and I couldn't be here to stop them all. He looked at the laughing young men in scarves and fingerless gloves and stolen top hats, dapper as Dickensian urchins. Some were open, openly sharpening knives and razors. In the sim world's more normal operation, they would be prone to no worse mischief than flinging snowballs at unsuspecting vicars and fat uncles. But even this evidence of a certain flexibility of ambition allowed by the system didn't change Orlando's feelings. They might have adjusted to the high level of local chaos, but these hooligans were still essentially the same kind of minor characters they had been in the world's earlier incarnations. It was becoming obvious that for all Kunahara's and Sellers' florid early predictions, a certain depth of reality, a flare of unpredictability, had gone out of the Otherland network for good with the death of the operating system. What was left was still fabulously complex, but ultimately lifeless. No wonder everyone keeps asking if I'm okay. It's not me that's the problem, it's this network. Nothing really changes, or if it does, it's just like ivy growing wild in someone's yard or something. The same kinds of changes over and over and over. It's not an evolving universe, it's a big broken toy, and even if it's more complicated than anything anyone ever made before, it's still never going to be like living in the real world. It wasn't so much a lack of other people that was depressing him, he realized. The Sims who inhabited the various worlds were astonishingly diverse and self-actualized, their interactive programming so flexible and their canned histories so comprehensive that in most cases you could never get to know any of them well enough to see the gaps in their near-perfect mimicry of life. But Orlando knew they weren't real. And that was a very big part of the problem. He was also the most powerful person in this pocket universe now that Sellers was gone and Hideki Kunahara was so frequently absent, which added to the imbalance between himself and his cohabitants. Yeah, 
that's it. That's who I am, he realized. I'm not Aragorn or the Lone Ranger. I really am Superman, like Sam said. I'm one of a kind in these worlds, and I'm going to spend my life doing things for people who are lesser beings, who won't ever seem quite real to me. And that's a long time to do something because I just might live forever. For the first time since he had been reborn into the system, his potential immortality felt more like a burden than a gift. The meeting was underway, but a few other latecomers were still wandering into the Bertram W. Wooster Memorial Salon, a chamber dedicated, Orlando had gathered, to a former Drones Club member who had been smothered to death by a mob of crazed railway porters during the unpleasantness. Orlando took his Coca-Cola and sat at the back of the room. His first requests for the beverage had baffled the club's bar staff, but the proprietor had stepped in and now a bottle of syrup and a siphon of soda water was waiting for him whenever he dropped in. That was only on meeting nights, of course. The Woodhouse simulation was not really his kind of world in the first place, and Orlando had never been interested in joining clubs even when he was alive, but the society was different. Before we welcome tonight's speaker, the chairman was saying, we have a few orders of business. Messages sent by members who were not able to attend tonight, but who nevertheless have information of importance to share. The chairman, Sir Reginald Delimu, was a handsome man in his middle thirties, hawk-nosed, lean, and tanned in a way that proclaimed him in this world as a laborer or an adventurer. He was clearly not a laborer. The gateway between Chrysostom's Byzantium and Toyland is no longer safe. Toyland is still unstable and some kind of military group has captured the shop where the portal operates and made it their headquarters. They are wooden soldiers, I am told, so unless you are a termite, it is suggested you avoid that gateway for now. A few of the club members laughed politely. Visitors to Toyland can still use the forest gate, which is protected by factions more sympathetic to free travel. Now, Still on the subject of gateways, we have a report of a new one discovered in Benin at an oasis just outside the city. As Delimu continued with the announcements, Orlando sipped his coke and studied him, wondering how much of the chairman's source personality remained. He was one of the Jongleur shadows, based on copies that had been made of Felix Jongleur, the Otherland Network's original master at a time when the ancient industrialist was planning to live forever within its circuits, a god ruling over many worlds. Jongleur had indeed achieved immortality of a sort, as had many of the network's other wealthy, powerful, and largely amoral founders from the Grail Brotherhood, but not in the way he or any of them had hoped. Instead of serving the purpose for which they had been intended, these copies, meant to be the basis for what would be immortal information-based incarnations, had been warped and changed during the last mad days of the, original, of the original operating system, then the copies had been allowed to scatter and disperse throughout the system. Nobody knew how many of them existed or what they had become, since there was no foolproof way to track individual sins in the huge network. One of the reasons Orlando Gordoner, Gardner, in his role as the network's conservator, had become involved with the World Walker Society was so that he could keep tabs on these various Grail Brotherhood clones, many of which seemed drawn to the club by a compulsion that might have been subconscious, their hidden psychological DNA at work. Orlando had been surprised at first that Kunahara and Sellers, the two men who best understood the Otherland system, had never even tried to remove these remnants of the network's original masters. But they had pointed out to him that even if all the shadow copies could be found and identified, they were not automatically criminal themselves any more than the children of a thief could be assumed to be inherently dishonest, and that even the least pleasant of the Grail Brotherhood originals were no worse than many of the other nasty sim personalities that were original inhabitants of some of the network worlds. It had been the Grail Master's personal wealth and power, and also their control over the network from the outside, that had made them dangerous. Inside the network, these 
clones and imitations started over from scratch, some with admitted personality defects, which cropped up in most incarnations, but others with a surprising capacity to become decent citizens. As he watched the society's chairman at work, Orlando thought that this particular version of Jean Gruer, Sir Reginald de Limou, seemed somewhere in the middle, sharp-tempered and obviously ambitious, but certainly no out-and-out -out villain. The other legacy granted to the Grail Shadows and a few similar beings that the old operating system had created, some based on Orlando's real friends and acquaintances like the Englishman Paul Jonas, was that they alone, of all the simulated souls on the network, could travel with relative freedom between the network worlds, or even knew that there were worlds outside of the simulation in which they lived. Unlike Orlando, most of these travelers did not understand what they were or what kind of universe they lived in, but they did, ha did have a freedom of thought that set them apart from the rest of the sins. In fact, they were the closest thing to, to equals Orlando Gardner had these days. Sitting around in the Drones Club bar after a World Walker meeting, listening to the humorous stories and impossible boasts of society members was the closest thing to the, to the happiness Orlando had once found in the adventurer's taverns of his old middle country game. And of course, even in their wildest stories, these walkers of worlds brought back gems of information which Orlando found very useful. He might be a ranger with godlike powers, but he still couldn't stamp out every untended campfire in 400 different worlds. When the chairman had finished his announcements, the featured speaker took the lectern and began to describe the findings from his most recent expedition. This gentleman seemed to have spent most of his time in Troy and Xanadu, two simworlds Orlando knew well, so he let his attention drift to other things. He became so caught up in wondering how to reconnect with Sam that he did not realize for several moments that someone who had harumped significant, sorry, he became so caught up in wondering how to reconnect with Sam that he did not realize for several moments that someone who had harumphed significantly several times behind him had given up on subtlety and was now tapping on his shoulder. Mr. Rowland, someone urgently wishes to speak with you. The tapper was the proprietor of the Drones Club, a tall poker-faced fellow named Jeeves, who rumors suggested had been in some kind of domestic service before the unpleasantness, but had risen very high very quickly during those unstable times. Did you hear me, Mr. Rowland? Orlando had almost forgotten his local pseudonym. Sorry, sorry, someone to see me. Could it be Beazle again, dressed for maximum embarrassment value in a cummerbund or pith helmet? But it was only when Orlando was in Rivendell, the closest thing to a refuge he had, that the agent wasn't allowed to contact him directly. It was hard to relax and enjoy the peaceful singing of the elves and the flickering of firelight, firelight when you were getting four or five calls an hour from a virtual bug with the raspy voice and abrupt manners of an old-school Brooklyn cabbie. Yes, uh, a visitor, sir, said Jeeves, leaning close. A young lady, very attractive, if I may say so, but perhaps a bit confused. I've taken the liberty of installing her in one of the unused lounges. Some of the older members are less than open-minded about women in the club, even now. I do beg pardon for interrupting you. She said it couldn't wait, and it seemed from her conversation that it might be something with which you would wish to deal discreetly. Orlando looked at the man's somber mouth, his tall, intelligent brow. Jeeves was not supposed to know who the world walkers really were. On the surface, they were only a stuffily ordinary club of travelers and adventurers who met at the Drones Club once a month let alone have even an inkling of Orlando Gardner's true nature. But he had always, tre always treated Orlando with extra care and a certain glint in the eye, as though he suspected him of being more than he appeared. Orlando, in turn, had often wondered whether the club's new owner weren't a world walker himself, albeit an undiscovered one. If so, he had found the perfect place to hide, right under the society's nose. Orlando made a mental note to do some research on this Jeeves fellow when he had some spare time. The society members in the Wooster Salon had fallen into civilized but contentious discussion about a proposed new expedition. 
Orlando knew they would be batting it around for at least half an hour and probably wouldn't finish the discussion this month. Jeeves led him to the doorway of the lounge before sliding away down the corridor, silent as a cat burglar. Orlando stepped into the snug room and almost knocked over a young woman dressed in a pale frock who was warming herself before the coal fire. It was only as he put out a hand to steady himself that he realized he was still carrying his Coca-Cola. Sorry, he said, and balanced the glass on the narrow mantel. Uh, my name is, is Roland. Uh, I'm told you were looking for me. She was pretty, as Jeeves had suggested, in a wide-eyed, consumptive sort of way, the darkness of her curly hair and the blush on her cheek only emphasizing the almost translucent pallor of her skin. She returned his stare a little wildly, as though any moment he might lunge at her, or worse, laugh at her. Perhaps I, I am mistaken, she said. I, I was told... I understood the person I was seeking could be found here. The name Roland was given to me. Uh, I'm looking for Orlando Gardner. She peered at him as though she might be nearsighted, or as though she were looking for a resemblance in a newly met, very distant relative. Then her face fell. But you are not him. I have never seen you before. He was astonished to hear his real name spoken aloud by a sim, and almost equally surprised to be told he was not himself. But after hearing, but hearing her voice confirmed what he had guessed when he had first seen her. This young woman was another Avial Jongleur shadow, either one of the original copies of Felix Jongleur's dead daughter, or a variant coined from those copies in the last days of the operating system. The original Avial had been obsessively in love with the Englishman Paul Jonas, and most of the copies, certainly all those that had been made from living Avial after she met Jonas, had continued this infatuation. They had popped up in numerous guises during Jonas's amnesiac wanderings through the Otherland network, sometimes encouraging him, sometimes actively aiding him, other times brokenly pleading for his love or understanding. But none of them had ever had much of anything to do with Orlando, and he had no idea why one should be seeking him now, especially under his real name. You say you haven't seen me before. He gestured for her to sit down. She seemed prepared to bolt like a rabbit at the slightest noise, and he was curious now. I have to admit I don't recognize you either. I do know someone named Orlando Gardner, however, and I might be able to get a message to him. Can you tell me something of your problem? The surroundings were beginning to get to him, he realized. He was starting to sound like one of this Woodhouse's Simworld's native characters. Oh, you, you know him? She looked a little more hopeful, but it was a miserable sort of hope, as though she had been told that instead of torture, she would be given a mercifully swift death. Where can I find him? You can give me a message. I promise he'll hear it. She brought a hand to her mouth, hesitating. She was very pale, shaking a little, but Orlando could see now that there was a determination behind the doe eyes that belied her outward appearance. She's taken some risk to come here, he thought. She must want to get this message to me very badly. Very well she said at last. My shame could not be any greater. I will trust your discretion, Mr. Roland. I will trust you to behave like a gentleman. Please tell Mr. Gardner that I need to see him as soon as possible. I am, I am in terrible straits. Terrible. If he does not come to me, I do not know what I shall do. Her reserve suddenly fell apart. Tears welled in her eyes. I am desperate, Mr. Rowland. But why? Orlando hunted, Orlando hunted vainly for a handkerchief, but she had already produced one of her own from her sleeve and was dabbing at her face. I'm, I'm sorry, Miss, Mrs. I'm afraid I don't know your name. Look, I, I don't want to make things worse, but I really do have to know why you want to speak with him before I can pass along your message. She looked at him, eyes still wet, and seemed to come to a decision. Her lips stopped trembling. 
It is not such an unusual story in this wicked world of ours, Mr. Rowland. My name is Livia Bard. I am an unmarried woman, and I am with child. The child is Mr. Gardner's. Then, as though they had reached the climax of a particularly good magic trick, the young woman simply vanished into thin air. And since it's 10 after, I think I'm going to call it there for the night, and we will continue where we left off next Sunday. Same bat time, same bat channel. I didn't say it, did I? Oh, well. Um, anyway, we will continue next Sunday. You will find more. Perhaps I'll have time to read the rest, but you will certainly find out more of Orlando and Mystery Woman and all kinds of other things. So with that said... Um, I am just looking here to see if there's anything that I needed to address. Nope. Apparently everybody's been able to hear and I'm grateful for that. Um, so from my humble down at the bottom of the house office where I am awake and everybody else is asleep. Yes, even the cat. Um, I will now take this time to say thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for taking care of yourself and your loved ones, but also taking care of other people in any way you can. And that can be helping to patronize local businesses that are hurting, over tipping, um, making sure that you call people who need to be called or contact people who are maybe stuck inside without a lot of company. Whatever you can do, we will all manage to get through this, but it's a really important time to help each other. Don't be an idiot. The world is full of idiots, and you folks, well, if you're readers and friends of mine, I already know you're too smart to be idiots, so tell other people not to be idiots. Okay. Anyway, with that, I'm going to say thank you again, and stay safe, stay healthy, and stay with me. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next Sunday, and until then, lots of love from our house to all of you and all of yours.